I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final episode in our series on key battles in the Revolutionary War. We've looked at all the key battles. We looked at what happened to the generals and statesmen that were fighting for the British and the patriots who later became the Americans. In this final episode, we're going to talk about what the Revolutionary War meant. What did it mean for world history? There's not a consensus among historians, so I'll do our best to look at some different perspectives and give some of our opinions on what we think it means overall. This is what everyone would agree is that it's one of few events that would shake the world order like the success of the American Revolution, because nearly every aspect of American life was somehow affected by the revolution, from slavery, eventually to women's rights, religious life, voting. And with the influence of the United States and global politics as the 19th and 20th centuries goes on, This has a lot of effect on new nation states that are developing across the globe, and many of them take their ideas of constitutional rights from the United States. So for better or for worse, it's very influential. Some changes are felt immediately where land inheritance laws, which I'll talk about more later, from England are swept away. The Anglican church no longer survives because the head of the Church of England is the British monarch, so that's not going to work very well in the United States. Other changes, though, take longer. Slavery isn't abolished for almost 100 years, but the dawn of an abolitionist movement begins and really starts to accelerate after the revolution. The revolution also produces a new outlook among its people that has ramifications long into the future. Groups that are excluded and not offered equality, such as slaves and women and other groups, draw inspiration from sentiments from the Revolutionary War. Americans begin to feel that their fight for liberty becomes a global fight in later generations. And like I said, future democracies model their governments on the United States. Yeah, not even not even democracies in some surprising nations. I'll give you an example. I listened to a lecture a long time ago, and the professor of the lecture, he, he starts out the lecture by quoting, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with the rights of uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm slightly paraphrasing there. but And he said to the audience, he said, so what am I quoting from? You know, and a bunch of hands go up and everybody says, oh, it's from the U.S. Declaration of Independence. He says, wrong. I'm quoting from the Declaration of Independence of Vietnam <laughs> <laughs> issued in 1945. So that passage that was so famous in the American Declaration of Independence was taken up by, of all people, Ho Chi Minh, and he himself wanted to jump on that bandwagon of all people are created equal, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. As we know, the American Declaration starts with when in the course of human events, blah, blah, blah. Jefferson doesn't jump right into the, we hold these truths to be self-evidence. But it's just interesting to me that nations as diverse as France and Vietnam plenty of others in Latin America and Africa and other places, but they've used the Declaration of Independence as a model. Of course, Vietnam ends up as a very different kind of country than the United States. But anyway, just I just thought I'd mention that. I don't want to get too far off the track. Even North Korea, the Democratic Republic of North Korea, is giving credence to the idea of democracy in its name, even though it is the opposite of democracy in every possible conceivable way. Well, The American Revolution has been criticized by modern-day historians. Uh, One 
Brian Kaplan writes, Can anyone tell me why American independence is worth fighting for? When you ask about specific libertarian policy changes that came about because of the revolution, it's hard to get a decent answer. Uh, he says, in fact, a 2020 hindsight, independence had two massive anti-libertarian consequences. It removed the last real check on American aggression against the Indians and allowed American slavery to avoid earlier and peaceful abolition. So on that first point there, that the check on American aggression against the Indians, like James mentioned in an earlier episode, before Americans gained independence, they were prevented from going across the Appalachian Mountains and were legally confined to the eastern seaboard. After the revolution, America gets land all the way up to the Mississippi River, and this leads to brutal conflict with Indian tribes that reside there. Andrew Jackson, some people think in revenge for attacks from Indian groups, launched the Trail of Tears later on. So this begins the process of continual pressing against American Indians that don't really end for another century and sometimes longer. Also, perhaps some think that if the United States had remained in the British Empire, slavery would have ended earlier and would have ended more peacefully and would have not required a brutal war to end it, as happened in the rest of the British Empire in the 1830s through the leadership of William Wilberforce. And what happens is that slave owners are paid a certain amount as compensation for freeing their slaves. And there's a process where they're trained as, um, I think, apprentices for a few years and then eventually freed. It's a massive amount of money they pay out, and it's funded by one of the Rothschilds, and it's not paid back, I think, into the 20th century. But there's no brutal civil war in the British Empire as there is in the United States. So this is one of the criticisms that things could have perhaps uh, ended better if it had not happened. Now, I'll mention some counter thoughts to that, but any thoughts on this, James? Yeah, just one other criticism. Famously, in the early 1900s, the uh, the historians Charles and Mary Beard publicized the thesis that the the rebels, the leaders of, or we would say the founding fathers or the leaders of the rebellion, they were just acting totally out of economic interest. You know, they were tired of the taxes and the restrictions on trade and and other things, and they they wanted to just make themselves richer by not by throwing off the the British system of taxation and all the other, and plus the the restriction on moving westward. Um, that has been mostly. Uh, I don't want to say debunked, but rejected by now, certainly. But that is a valid criticism. You you could argue, at, at least you could argue that the the rebels, Washington and Jefferson and all them, that the, the rebels were acting primarily out of economic interest. I, I, I don't know if I would say it was primarily. Uh, maybe. I, I'm not going to come down on one side of the issue or not. But, but definitely... Uh, it wasn't just out of pure patriotism and you know, it wasn't just standing up for our rights. A lot of it had to do with the almighty dollar. So that's another criticism that could be leveled at the revolution. In terms of those who argue the other side, that the revolution did bring net positive effects. One is Jeffrey Hummel, who argues in an article for the Library of Economics and Freedom that things worked out better for the cause of global abolitionism with American independence than it would have happened had America remained part of the British Empire. So he argues that over the long run, uh, it created benefits for Americans, but also people across the globe. So speculations that without the American Revolution, treatment of the indigenous population um, would have been more just or that slavery would have been abolished earlier are missing some key they're not taking everything into consideration. He says a stronger case can be made that without the American Revolution, the condition of Native Americans would have been no better, and the emancipation of slaves in the British West Indies would have been significantly delayed, and the condition of European colonists throughout the British Empire, not just those in what became the United States, would have been worse. So what he says is, prior to the American Revolution, every New World colony, British or otherwise, legally sanctioned slavery, and nearly every colony counted enslaved people among its population. 
As late as 1770, nearly twice as many Africans were in bondage throughout the colony of New York as within Georgia, although slaves were a much larger percentage of Georgia's population. But with the American Revolution, it brought about outright abolition or gradual emancipation in all northern states by 1804. Vermont, although it participated in the revolution as an independent republic until it was permitted to join the Union in in 1791, was the first jurisdiction to abolish adult slavery in 1777. The Confederation Congress also prohibited the extension of slavery into the Northwest Territory in 1786. So there's a tendency to minimize this first emancipation in the northern states because it was less economically entrenched in the northern colonies than in the southern colonies, and because in many northern states, slavery was gradually eliminated. But, I mean, emancipation had to start somewhere, And the fact that it did so where opposition was the weakest doesn't diminish the radical nature of eliminating this labor system that had basically existed throughout human history. And slavery had also largely died out with Britain. And I have a massive uh, podcast series on slavery where slavery mostly dies out in Britain in the Middle Ages. And the fact that they allow it in their colonies is kind of this moral hypocrisy. Uh, But Masters continued to bring slaves occasionally into the country and were able to hold them there. And British Parliament didn't formally end and entirely abolish slavery until 1833. But even in America's southern colonies and the states, the revolution's assault on slavery did make some some inroads, even though it didn't (coughs) end the practice. Uh, Several southern states banned the importation of slaves and relaxed the nearly universal restrictions on masters voluntarily freeing their slaves. About 10,000 Virginia slaves were freed through manumission, and more were freed in Massachusetts by judicial decree. So this spawned the first substantial communities of free blacks, which were the origins of the hotbeds of the abolitionist movement, and they produced abolitionist papers and abolitionist literature that were very important as this movement gained steam in the 19th century. So this helps induce a slow partial decline of slavery. So by 1810, for example, three quarters of African Americans in Delaware were freed through this process. And I want to read two quotes that show Americans were realizing that uh, the language of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which pro- uh, promises universal liberty, this was hypocrisy compared to the nature of slavery. So the revolution is at least showing people that full emancipation should happen by the promises of these documents. And um, it's hypocrisy that we do not currently have this. Uh, one is by Abra- One is by Abraham Lincoln, and the other one is by Frederick Douglass. Uh, so let's see. First of all, Abraham Lincoln says, as a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it. All men are created equal except Negroes. When the know nothings, the political party get control, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. When it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving Liberty to Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure And without the base alloy of hypocrisy. (laughs) Yeah, this is in 1855 when he's writing to his friend Joshua Speed, who uh, I believe did own slaves at the time. The other one, probably more powerful, is from Frederick Douglass, who writes, he has a speech in July 5th, 1852 called, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And I'm just picking out excerpts here. It's a long speech, but definitely worth reading. To him, he's saying, what does the Fourth of July mean to a slave? To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Now, if we just stop there, it makes it sound like he completely rejects the American experiment, but he doesn't because you need to read the conclusion where he says that let's uphold the promises of uh, the American nation. Allow me to say in conclusion Notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened, and the doom of slavery is certain. I, therefore, leave off where I began with hope. 
while drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. So what do you think, James? Well, I tell you what, Lincoln's views on slavery and race are very complicated, and you can make an argument for Lincoln's. Some people say, oh, he was a total racist, and they're saying, no, he was way ahead of his time. So there's entire books written on that topic. But yeah, it's uh, it's a very mixed legacy. You certainly see the seed of abolitionism. I know in the early, well, I should say in the late 1700s, maybe very early 1800s, there were a lot of people, even in the South, that wanted to see slavery go away. I mean, even Washington, Washington and Jefferson, they had slaves, but they weren't happy about it. And and they would have liked to have seen slavery go away, but they, not their, not their own slaves. You know, it's like, we need it too bad. We, if they didn't have slaves, they would collapse financially. So they needed the slaves, even though they weren't happy about the fact that they had them or needed them. Uh, Washington actually manumitted his slaves. Uh, actually, people say that he set free his slaves upon his death. Technically, he didn't own a lot of his slaves himself outright. Some of his slaves, a good chunk of them, were actually owned by his wife's estate. So uh, most of them were not set to be freed until Martha died rather than George. But she did free some of them anyway, because that's a very awkward position. <laughs> if you, you, know, you think George dies, there's Martha. Here's all these slaves, a couple hundred slaves or so, give or take. And as soon as she dies, they become free. So <laughs> if you're married, you're thinking, these guys are just sitting around waiting for me to die. Who's to say one won't <laughs> make that happen sooner than later? But, but yeah, I, I think the problem is, is that the, with the invention of the cotton gin and the, the amazing uh, transforming effect it has on Southern agriculture, turning cotton into an extremely lucrative cash crop. Once that happens, that increases the demand for slave labor. And these ideas of slavery being a necessary evil and hopefully it'll go away one day, those pretty much disappear. And the Southerners, they have to come up with new ways of thinking to justify slavery. So they come up with the positive good argument and all that. And eventually um, abolitionism increases in the North while at the same time as it disappears in the South, pretty much. And that leads you right to the Civil War. But anyway, that's a series for another day. It's too bad we didn't do a series on the Civil War, Scott. I know. Um, I mean, hypothetically, it's almost like it could be almost two dozen episodes that flesh, <laughs> f- flesh out these arguments way more. Wait, we did. Okay, <laughs> okay. so anyway, there you go. Yeah, li- listeners, right. listen to the first couple episodes. Shameless plug. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you should check it out. But one last thing I'll mention uh, with slavery is that one off-repeated argument is that without American independence, the when the British Empire abolishes it in 1833, this would have happened in America. But others argue that thanks to American independence, pro-slavery factions, whether in the American South or those British citizens who owned plantations in the West Indies, they were isolated from each other and couldn't form an effective political bloc. But had America remained in the British Empire, they would have. And this could have actually perhaps delayed uh, emancipation. Uh, so British emancipation had to overcome stiff political opposition of West Indian planters. And emancipation caused a collapse of production in the Sugar Islands. It was costly for the British economy. If American cotton, tobacco, rice, and sugar planters had still been under British rule, they would have inevitably allied with West Indian sugar planters, and they would have been a far more powerful pro-slavery lobby. And by 1833, American cotton had been become more essential to the British economy than Caribbean sugar. So bear in mind that it was a spread of cotton cultivation in the United States in the early 19th century that reversed what little anti-slavery impulse emerged during the revolution in the southern states. So without U.S. independence, slavery could have very well persisted in both North America and the West Indies after 1865. I mean, after all, it continues into in um, Brazil until the 1880s and many parts of the Middle East into the 20th century. So it was by no means a foregone conclusion that emancipation would have taken place. Yeah, economics does tend to rule. (laughs) Yeah, people are just motivated by money a lot of times, sadly. All right. Well, that's that part. I want to mention uh, separation of church and state, the other aspect of the revolution, which is very important. 
The revolutionary separation of church and state was more pronounced in the South than in the North, unlike slavery. The British colonies prior to the revolution practiced a high degree of religious toleration. There were only four of the 13 colonies had no established tax-supported church. They were Rhode Island, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. But as a result of the revolution, five other Southern states in New York disestablished the Anglican church. With the adoption of the Constitution and then the First Amendment, the United States became the first country to separate church and state at the national level. This isn't exactly at the state level, at least in the beginning of the United States. Several New England states retained their established congregational church, and Massachusetts was the last to fully abolish tax support as late as 1833. So there was a state church in Massachusetts, and even today in New England, you'll see a bunch of congregational churches So it's easy to overlook this in the modern era, but this was unprecedented at this period. And uh, later on, there are much stronger constitutional protections for separation of church and state. But back then, this was revolutionary. So that's another important factor. Hey, everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. That's a huge aspect of American history. And the United States is by far the most religious country in the world, at least among those from a Christian background. I always tell my students that you need to make that distinction. We can't say we're the most religious nation in the world, period, because that would leave out the Islamic world. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast play of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts, about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts and other areas, uh, other countries with different religious backgrounds. But among all the nations that come from a traditionally Christian background, the U.S. is by far the most religious. We have the greatest percentage of people that attend church every Sunday, and others all read the Bible. You can name all kinds of factors. And most people seem to believe, and I agree with this, that part of the reason of this is because we haven't had an official state church. The fact that you have different Uh, Christian denominations who have, for the lack of a better word, they have to compete for their customers, if you will. (laughs) You know, it's it's almost an economic model. Uh, Obviously, it's not it's not the same as a business. The church is not a business, but some of them do act like one (laughs) sometimes. But but the fact of the matter is, is since there's competition for the religious uh, allegiances of people, this makes religious. institutions, the different churches and whatnot, they have to put out a quality product, right? Again, I'm using economic <laughs> terms, but but they have to they have to be better. They have to try to to be more appealing to people. They have to attract people. Whereas if you have a place where you have just one state religion for hundreds of years, that's the only game in town. And uh there's no incentive to improve yourself. You know, there's no reason not to have, for example, illiterate clergymen and clergymen, <clears throat> excuse me, clergymen who live lives that are opposed to the Christian gospel and things like that. Not that we don't have that in the U.S., that you have had that in the U.S., but but there's a fervency that I think is caused by the religious multiplicity in the United States that you just don't have elsewhere. What do you think? Do you agree with me on that, Scott? Yeah, I mean, and there's probably plenty of studies you can find that look at religious groups according to strictly economic models, like you said. That's one method of analysis. And in a more robust free market, that's another way to look at it. Uh, Another aspect, too, of the influence of the revolution is Republican governments. Uh, Because of the revolution, nearly all the former colonies had written state constitutions 
that set up Republican governments with limitations on state power that were embodied in their Bill of Rights. Only Rhode Island and Connecticut tried to operate under their colonial charters with minor modifications. The new state constitutions extended the franchise, with Vermont being the first jurisdiction to adopt universal male suffrage with no property qualifications and explicitly without regard to color. Much more open than um, Britain, maybe not on the national level of the United States, but on the state level, it very well could be. Uh, Going along with this was a reform of penal codes throughout the former colonies and making them less severe. And you got that you eliminated brutal physical punishments like branding, which was still widely practiced in Britain at the time. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. I think drawing and quartering and some of the nastier medieval punishments are gone, but maybe not. Uh, For example, Virginia reduces the number of capital crimes from 27 down to two of murder and treason. Uh, So that for human rights, that's a good thing for the 18th century. Not too bad. Not bad at all. Yeah. All All right. right. The, The other thing, this is probably the biggest change, and that's the end of feudalism and aristocracy. The dying embers of these are still burning brightly in some places in the British Empire and throughout Europe as well, France which the French Revolution tries to violently upend. This is probably the most diffuse of the revolution's consequences. You have the end of things like quit rents, which is a feudal land tax that had been paid to colonial proprietors or to the crown. This had been due in all colonies outside of New England and were now terminated. The new states abolished primogenitor, which is the sole right of inheritance to the firstborn son, And it also, the states abolish entail, which is a prohibition of the sale, breakup, or transfer to outside the family of an estate. These are aristocratic codes that institutionalize the power of a family. That means breaking into power is also much harder. So this eliminated economically inefficient feudal encumbrances on land titles, but it was also a blow to hereditary privilege because it undermined traditional patterns of inheritance and facilitated the rights of daughters and widows to possess property. If you basically, if you ever read a Jane Austen novel, the plots are basically entirely concerned with this of comedies of manners of men trying to gain the hand of a woman that will allow him to enter into this aristocratic family and who's going to get married to whom and who's getting the money. (laughs) So you'll see a lot of bookish literature nerds who are caught up in all these aristocratic legal codes, but If you're reading these now, you can still appreciate a Jane Austen novel as a craft of good writing and the universal themes of the human condition. But when you're wondering why people are so caught up in things, you think, wait, what's going on? Why why does this matter if they get married? So this is what's happening. Um, uh, But at the same time, all states except South Carolina also liberalize their divorce laws. And here's an interesting irony. The treatment of loyalists during the revolution indirectly contributed to the erosion of feudal entitlements. Uh, Here's what I mean. There's a claim that only one third of Americans supported the revolution. One third were neutral and the other third were opposed. This is repeated, but this is sort of a misreading of a letter written by John Adams in 1812, referring to American attitudes about the French revolution. Historians mostly think that about 40 to 50% of the white population were active patriots about 15 to 20% were loyal to loyalists. Maybe they had financial incentive or ideological reason to be loyalists. And the remainder were neutral or kept a low profile, like Quakers that might have been uh, conscientious objectors. These proportions varied across the region and over time. But all the new states passed laws confiscating loyalist estates. Many of these estates were grants to royal placemen. And the confiscations entailed a redistributionist land reform. Uh, So Gordon Wood, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning The Radicalism of the American Revolution, writes about the impact of this revolutionary aspect of the war. He notes that in 1760, there were two million monarchical subjects living in the British colonies, and they took it for granted that society was and ought to be a hierarchy of ranks and degrees of dependency. But by the early years of the 19th century, the revolution, quote, had created a society fundamentally different from the colonial society of the 18th century. And one way to view this transformation is through language. 
you, employees are no longer referring to the employers as master or mistress, but the, they use a loan word from the Dutch language of boss, which is just a kind of a general person who's my manager, but he doesn't have any sort of official or social superiority to me. Or men began to refer to themselves as mister. Before that, it was a tradition confined to the gentry. Now, any man was a mister. In the revolution's aftermath, indentured servitude for immigrants withers away. Most states eliminate legal sanctions enforcing long-term labor contact contracts for residents. So you have the modern system of free labor, where most workers outside the military can quit at will. This is contrasted with the British, where up to 1823, uh, Parliament passed the Master and Servant Act that prescribed criminal penalties for breaking a labor contract. Oh, wow. wow. <clears throat> yeah. So Wood concludes that Americans have become almost overnight the most liberal, the most democratic, the most commercially minded, and the most modern people in the world. The revolution not only radically changed the personal and social relations of people, but also destroyed aristocracy as it had been understood in the Western world for at least two millennia. The revolution brought respectability and even dominance to ordinary people long held in contempt and gave dignity to their menial labor in a manner unprecedented in history and to a degree not equaled elsewhere in the world. The revolution did not just eliminate monarchy and create republics. It actually reconstituted what Americans meant by public or state power. So what do you think, James? USA! USA! Yeah. Is that, uh, are those quotes from Gordon Wood, are those from the radicalism of the American Revolution? Yes. Yeah, that's not surprising. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's pretty much the way it is. I would agree. Um, I, that it's silly for me to say I agree with Gordon Wood, like this brilliant uh, you know, scholar of the American Revolution for many decades versus me, just a common Joe. But um, it's interesting. Yeah. The, it's I'll just piggyback on one thing you said there. We don't have any kind of titled nobility. Nobody can be like Sir Scott Rank or <laughs> Sir James Early. We don't have lords and ladies. I mean, well, yeah. we do have Sir Ringo Starr and Sir Paul McCartney, I guess. And some yeah, but Beatles. they're Brits. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're Brits. They're not Americans. The American government cannot confer any title of nobility on anybody. Do you remember the one general that called himself Lord Sterling? <laughs> that was one of, uh, he's one of my favorite generals. I should have put him in the, what happened to them afterward, but that was long enough already. But he claimed that his father had had a long dormant ancestral claim to some noble uh, estate in Scotland or something. And his, his real name was William Alexander, but he insisted on being called Lord Sterling. So, <laughs> You know, it was, it's interesting that the when the Americans dealt with the British on a formal level, we talked about several times there were some peace negotiations, or at least negotiations of some type. Uh, they were, the Americans were very polite and deferential. And Benjamin Franklin referred to uh, Howe, Admiral Howe, as my lord and things like that. So there was a respect for that kind of thing among Americans, but certainly no desire to have it themselves, at least not for most Americans. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. If you study history, depending on where you look at it in the world, it is incredibly cumbersome to deal with titles in the Ottoman Empire. When someone writes something to the Sultan, the first two or three sentences are caught up with their titles. Oh, man. Habsburg history, it's endless titles. Um, in American society, outside of if you're respectfully referring to a military person, you might mention their rank, even if they're retired. But outside of religious titles for a member of the clergy, that could be something. But it, we really don't use them too much. It's not something we're tied up with. Yeah. And then, uh, one other thing related to that, if you think about... Americans who became generals in the Civil War versus British people who became generals in, let's say, let's say the Crimean War. It happened just a little bit earlier than the Civil War. If you were going to be an officer in the British Army in the 17 or 1800s, and especially if you were going to get high up, you had to be uh, of the nobility, or at least you had to be most of you. You, you certainly. It, most people were, if not all, you had to pay these ridiculous amounts of money. If you wanted to be a general, we talked about this a long time ago in the series, you had to pay a boatload of money. It had nothing to do with your training, your background, 
There was no military school for quite some time. But if you were going to be a general in the U.S. Army during the Civil War, it's because you went to West Point, right? Or or at least, you know, in the Civil War, there were so many generals that, as we saw, they had to recruit people that hadn't been to West Point. So people who had, were polit- political leaders. But it wasn't necessarily because of your wealth. If you think about Ulysses S. Grant, he came, he was in just about in dirt poverty. He was very poor when the Civil War broke out. He was working as a clerk in a store in Galena, Illinois, for crying out loud. So so that's another ramification uh, of this idea of no nobility is anybody rich or poor could conceivably work their way up to the top of the military hierarchy as well as the business world. You didn't have to start out rich, uh, whereas in the British Army, you definitely had to. Yeah, and what happens with the influence of the Revolutionary War, it's not contained in the United States. I mean, we do see that the effects take a long time to trickle out, but they do trickle out, and they even affect the British Empire. Uh, So what happens is that it inspires other anti-monarchical, democratic, or independence movements we see in the French Revolution. Turns out a lot bloodier there. But it also inspires uh, movements in Netherlands, Belgium, Geneva, Ireland, and the French sugar island of Saint-Domingue, or modern Haiti. But something that is a little bit less well understood is how the revolution affected British polity with respect to its settler colonies. Some argue that imperial authorities became more cautious about imposing the rigid authoritarian control they had tried in the American colonies before the revolution they became increasingly accommodated settler dem- they increasingly accommodated settler demands for autonomy and self government well not in all cases there were basically two forms of british imperialism one was for native peoples and the other for imperial s- european settlers and you can guess which one was better than the other uh the softer accommodations for european settlers was immediately apparent in canada Parliament's Constitutional Act of 1791 divided Quebec into two colonies, Upper and Lower Canada, each with its own elected assembly, that representative government. It also ended quit rents. And this is really ironic, but contributing to these outcomes was the influx of American loyalists who, even though they opposed American independence, they embraced Republican ideals. Nova Scotia, half the population was were new arrivals from New England. They had a representative assembly as early as 1758, and the revolution's outbreak forced the royal governor to propose reforms to maintain the colony's loyalty. Nova Scotia had three times as many loyalists as Quebec, which led in 1784 to the partitioning off of New Brunswick with its own assembly. But there were similar movements for assemblies in Australia and New Zealand and British colonies, Um, Now, you do not see this type of thing in the British Empire with colonies that do not have um, European settlement in Africa and India and other places. So don't want to say this was uniformly positive all across the board. Uh, But Sir Guy Carleton, you remember the former commander in chief of British forces in America, complained, it's not in the revolted provinces alone that a Republican spirit is to be found, but the tint has spread to other parts of the America and to the West Indies. That's his take. Do you think that's a fair shake on things, uh, James? Oh, you know, those those troublesome Americans always yeah. going everywhere and causing trouble and stirring things up. But yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then I already mentioned earlier that some argue, like Jeffrey Hummel, that without U.S. independence, slavery could have very well persisted in North America and the West Indies. So I won't go over that again. Uh, a couple of things for conclusion. Just overall, I want to mention. Um, that if you look at world history, few revolutions actually bestow benefits. Revolutionary activity is very risky. It usually doesn't succeed. It typically leads to a lot of death. The French Revolution, I think, is a much more common example of what a revolution looks like than the American Revolution. And it's not a positive word in many contexts. Uh, Once a revolution succeeds, if it does succeed... Um, excluding from any general benefits from those who didn't participate if difficult and not impossible. I mean, revolutions are almost always messy and produce mixed results. 
Gordon Tulek, uh, he wrote a 1971 article that said, historically, the common form of revolution has been a not too efficient despotism, which is overthrown by another not too efficient despotism with little or no effect on the public good. <laughs> That's awfully cynical. <laughs> yeah. But probably true. You could look at the Roman Empire in the third century when there are the the in constant the, revolutions, revolutions yeah, every time you turn around. Yeah, people your your farmer who has little idea of what's happening with elite Roman politics, there's wars that are constantly breaking out. You don't understand why. Civil war after civil war after civil war in the Ottoman Empire, for my case, claimants to the throne, different sons of the Sultan are putting to death thousands in order to be able to achieve it for there's very little political uh, reform that happens as a result of it. Many times it gets worse Uh, in Africa. There are some positive cases after the end of colonialism. And I'm a favor of the end of the end of colonization of Africa. Some nations fare well, other nations fare very poorly where you have a leader like Idi Amin, who is probably one of the most brutal dictators of the 20th century. And the only reason he didn't achieve the level of Stalin is because he didn't have enough people to kill. Um, So this is a good reason why a lot of people just simply wouldn't look positively on revolution. Uh, But sometimes a revolution can bring about positive effects. And arguably many have said the American revolution is such a case. When the farmers who stood at Lexington uh, green and Concord bridge in 1775, as we saw at the beginning of our series, many of them were only part-time soldiers. They had families to support and daily cares to attend to, and they had hard lives. The British redcoats they faced were highly trained and disciplined soldiers who were serving in the world's best trained and most powerful military power. But when they fired the shot heard around the world, Arguably, they initiated a positive wave of effects that benefited American citizens, but then later people throughout the world with all the movements and constitutional democracy that even if many nations don't live up to it, and sometimes America doesn't as well, there's at least the ideal that people purport to uh, want to live up to. So they had... Many people at the beginning of the war, they might not have hoped that it could have achieved an outcome as well as it did. But for many, against all reasonable expectation, the Revolutionary War succeeded, and it was as beneficial as I think many could have hoped for, even in their wildest dreams. And it took a long time to live up to those ideals, and there's still a constant attempt to live up to these ideals, sometimes better than other times. But it is at least, I would say, a noble effort. So if there's a reason to celebrate the 4th of July. I would say that's it. So fire up the grill. You have a good reason to celebrate it. That's my editorial take as a historian. Do you agree or disagree, James, that the Revolutionary War was worth it? I think it was. I agree with you. Of course, I'm an American like you, so I'm a little bit biased. But yes, I I think you could argue that a lot of bad over the next couple hundred years and, and plus would come as a result of the establishment of the United States of America. But I think for the most part... The balance sheet is on the positive side. I'd agree too. All right. Well, that's our series, Key Battles in the Revolutionary War. You can go back and listen to the whole thing. Check out our other series, Key Battles in the Civil War and Presidential Fight Club. Probably not the end. I don't know if we want to plant any Easter eggs here for future series. Yeah, let's keep our hand close to our uh, close to the vest. But I will say that Scott and I really enjoy doing this, and I kind of doubt we're done. Yeah, there's plenty of other things in history to check out, so we may look at other things in the future. All right, well, that was Key Battles in the Revolutionary War. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com, where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of Madeira and raise a toast to liberty.
I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts.